on this book is drawn from real life. I mean, like I researched it at the law library. It's sort of stretched in places here, but uh, you know, you have the declaration of a state of emergency. You have the federal government has exercised its constitutionally express power to suspend habeas corpus in what it deems to be times of insurrection. Uh, the governor of the state has declared martial law in the counties where there's been this, you know, bad hurricane damage. Uh, and, uh, you know, and deployed units of the Texas military forces that are enshrined in our state constitution. And you've got kind of the Coast Guard out there turned into like some kind of FEMA Gestapo. I use the Coast Guard because, one, they're kind of like the perfect climate change Gestapo in a way. And two, because they are the only uniform branch of the armed services of the United States that can be lawfully deployed to deal with civilian stuff. Author Christopher Brown was our first guest when the Plutopia podcast was rebooted in 2018. His dystopian novels have been widely praised and described as Better Call Saul meets 1984. In this episode of the Plutopia podcast, John and Scoop talk with Chris about his latest novel, Rule of Capture. Welcome to the Plutopia News Network. Yet another podcast. And our second interview today with our pal, Chris Brown, author of Rule of Capture, just released book and a kind of prequel to his earlier Tropic of Kansas. And this is a book that's getting a lot of attention. I can't wait to see the miniseries when, it, when it's <laughs> out, right? Neither can I. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I guess I should mention that uh, the Plutopia News Network as a Twitter account at Plutopia and we also have a Facebook page for Plutopia News Network so we hope that you will all visit us there and we also hope that you will all go back and listen to our long history of, uh, of many other interviews including the one that we did with Chris previously but fact, here, you were the first of our after we revived the uh, Plutopia 2.0. Mm -hmm. You aided aid in poor Rocky's revival. Awesome. Yeah. So here we are to talk about Rule of Capture, and I guess my first question is why did you decide to write nonfiction? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I set out to write kind of what I like to call speculative realism, for lack of a better term, or at least to write a kind of uh, science fiction or speculative fiction or fantastic fiction, whatever you want to call it, that's mostly made up from the material of the observed world. Um, one that uses that speculative prism to um, to kind of show truths about the real, real world uh, that conventional modes of realism cannot. And so it is trying to tell a lot of truth in a kind of literary sense, even if, you know, the world of the book is a little bit uh, altered, kind of put up to a fun house mirror. As yeah, it's were. not like predictive science fiction. It's more like science fiction that's really kind of present, right? Yeah, well, you know, and it's, I think, kind of conventional modes of futurity. I find, uh, I don't know, at least with these books have kind of, I mean, bored me is maybe too strong a term, but they weren't really engaging in what I thought was interesting. And um, and this book in particular is kind of, in a way, it's sort of trying to glean the imminent now from the past, right? And, and not just the kind of immediate recent past, but even like the deeper past in a way. And, and, and from that, maybe to uh, kind of uh, find some uh, uh, soundings of you know what direction a better future could lie. And this this uh, sort of near future that you describe in the book uh, has uh, an alternate history preceding it, right? Different things have happened than have actually happened. Yeah, well, Tropic of Kansas explicates a kind of an alternate uh, present as it were, or near future, uh, one that really, in my mind, is basically an alternate present and that um, departs from our world in the 80s. Uh, and it basically in the world, in, in Tropic of Kansas, it's, it's, it's explained that that's a world in which uh, 
Ronald Reagan was assassinated by John Hinckley and uh, the, uh, Al Haig was his vice president at the time, became the president and became a kind of mad general, uh, especially after the uh, Iranians killed all of the hostages and uh, a kind of a, a much more intense conflict in the Middle East came about. And so there's a sort of a, a, a darker world, but all of that's really kind of like deep backstory that's almost expendable in a way. Did you, did you precede the writing of this book with the development of that backstory or, or was it something you came up with for Tropic of Kansas? Or it was something you... I had mainly come up with for Tropic of Kansas, but for this book, in many respects, it's uncoupled from that, even though it, it, it works in a continuity with that book. But uh, this book, the alternate history detail is a, is a little bit more embedded in many respects, but in other respects, it's much more kind of front and center in that uh, it takes place in an America that's experiencing its own kind of Weimar moment, uh, analogous to you know Weimar Germany after World War I, where in this book, the, the U.S. has been defeated in a, in a kind of humiliating war with China. Not a big, long, protected and bloody war, one that's more of a, you know, about technological assets and surveillance assets and orbital assets and things like that, but one that's been uh, very devastating to, you know, the relative uh, uh, geopolitical standing of the U.S. And so the U.S. is under, like, treaty accords and austerity programs and, um, uh, and uh, as a kind of a nationalistic matter, it's been sort of humiliated. And, um, and so in that context, it introduces a very different kind of political dynamic that's equally intense to the one we're experiencing in our culture at the moment, maybe more intense, but, but uncoupled from our normal kind of partisan models because it's more about nationalism versus you know, kind of an idea of an emerging global order. As I read the book, there's that early reference to the war with China. And uh, now that I've got you here, I can ask you the question that was in my head at the time. How hot was that war with China? Where, was it like nuclear or, or was it more political? I mean, the idea was that in the world of this book, uh, the militarization of space is much more advanced and that the U.S. has had a kind of a hegemony that's partly based on, you know, uh, uh, imagine if the Star Wars program had been real, right? Um, and, uh, or been kind of more fully, you know, uh, fleshed out along those lines. And so the Chinese have basically, it's kind of been of a, an orbital Pearl Harbor, if you will, that kind of completely kind of upended the power balance. That's the sort of the premise, and, and in a way that's sort of as deep as it goes. Um, uh, because the point really is about looking inward and, uh, and looking at how um, uh, 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 these kinds of circumstances lead to a, a new kind of political division and a sort of uh, uh, state of emergency that results in the suspension of due process of law. And it seems like a lot of the political ethos of, the, of this time in this book really is focused around Texas. Like Texas is very prominent uh, within the nation as a historic, I mean, I mean as a political entity. Is, am I right about that? That Texas yeah, I mean, has this more book, this, weight? Well, this book takes place in Texas uh, and, uh, and it happens that the characters in the book uh, are involved in events that have significance far beyond Texas as they learn over the course of the story. Uh, the Texas of this book. I mean, I wanted to write a book about Texas uh, and use Texas as a kind of a exemplar and proxy for a lot of things that are, you know, also American and also kind of global characteristics of how um, uh, kind of how nations are made or how, you know, uh, uh, how uh, there's a kind of a palimpsest of history hiding in plain sight in a place like this, which is to anyone, I think, who's lived in it for long enough or a reasonable period of time can see is kind of colonized space, right? Texas does like to think of itself as kind of a nation state, too. And it's, and it's a good, and for a book that's trying to deal with, you know, issues around, you know, the law of the conqueror, Texas is a very good place because Texas 
kind of in, and I think, you know, this was it Stephen Harrigan, that historian of Texas, I think he talked about this, how uniquely among the American uh, uh, territories, Texas has a creation myth that is not about some sort of noble utopian, you know, we came here into the into the blank slate wilderness and kind of created our little utopian community. It's like, no, we came and we took it because we're badasses and we're sort of proud of it. And in the way that that's kind of front and center in the Texas uh, uh, kind of uh, self-identification. Yeah, we took it, we fought hard to keep it. Yeah, it's that hard scrabble ethos. Yeah, yeah like, you know, and... Well, I found it interesting that you set this in Houston. How did Houston become the stage for this dysfunctional, well, if, I mean, if you've been to Houston, you know the answer, but <laughs> how did it come to be Houston? Because it was very familiar to me. I worked as a journalist in Houston in the early 70s when things were not nearly as uh, progressive as some parts of Houston <laughs> have become. Uh, how did, did you decide on that as a place to have this dysfunctional society? That's a great question, Scoop. I mean, um, partly it was just continuity because in Tropic of Kansas, the character who is the main protagonist of this book uh, briefly appears kind of kind of in the, at the margins. He's like a billboard lawyer that one of the characters calls to get sprung out of jail and it happens to be when they're in Houston. But as I was thinking about this, I didn't have to follow that. I mean, the guy could move town to town or whatever, or he could be a different lawyer. But um, Houston to me is a really interesting city. You know, I was um, I was just remarking to a guy the other day about how to me, you know, Houston is like more like the future Los Angeles of Blade Runner than the real Los Angeles could ever hope to be. The you first know? time I ever drove to Houston, I, I said, oh, well, there's down, downtown Houston there. And, and it's like, no, wait, there's downtown Houston over there. And it turns out there's like buildings everywhere because they didn't have any, what, codes or restrictions. They just... No, it was the Wild West for developers. and. If you remember the 80s, you could drive through Houston and see through all of these giant I do high remember. rises that had been built on speculation and that uh, that dream never came true and they had empty buildings everywhere. Yeah, it was the first time I visited Houston it was like in 87 or 88 right after the bust and um, it did uh, it did have those empty skyscrapers. It was kind of singularly Ballardian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the but, government was very strange in those, especially the 70s and into the 80s. It was a transition from the uh, the very old school Houston to a, what people hoped was a more progressive Houston. And uh, that didn't seem to pan out since you know, the problems that uh, you detail in, in the story seem to have, you know, uh, real world applications in, in the Houston of today. Yeah, well, and you know, and so in Houston, yeah, because of those things, it's this kind of libertarian wonderland in a way. So if you want to, you want to explore kind of extremes of an, a kind of an American market ethos, you know, in, a, in an urban uh, uh, setting, it works really well. Um, Houston is a perfect place to dig into the kinds of themes about urban ecology that I'm trying to play with in this book, because it's a really crazy green city. You know, I did all for, you know, over the years, I spent a lot of time kind of exploring around Houston and I did some more deliberate research for this book, kind of digging into like, you know, places where you can like canoe in the, you know, interstices of the ship channel and, you know, like paddle down and there's like, you know, wild waterfowl and, you know, on one side and uh, flare offs on the other side. And uh, it's really interesting that way. Um, that kind of crazy zoning of Houston where, I mean, it's like my wife jokes that, you know, in her 
uh, high school in, 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 in Houston, she had a, they had a head shop on one side of that and one, across one street and a male strip club across the other street because, you know, no zoning and, you know, and all they needed then was like an abortion clinic and like a gun store to kind of complete the quadrifecta. Yeah, my and, friends in Houston said the only real zoning was done by the uh, local religious organizations who tended to exert more power than the city government as far as, you know, if you want to do that here, you're going to have to please them. Yeah, well, and the other thing is that um, uh, Houston, I think, is like a really interesting place for the ferment of the avant-garde in like a way that's really probably counterintuitive to most people because they kind of think of Houston as that, you know, that big kind of crazy polluted oil and gas town. Yeah, but they've got the Rothko Gallery, they've got the Manil Gallery. Yeah, and you have, you know, and I think, culture. I mean, there's just incredible music culture. I mean, whether it's from, you know, stuff like DJ Screw and this kind of DIY uh, homegrown uh, mixed culture, yeah, to the contemporary people like Jawad Taylor and uh, Persef Juan and uh, Dave Dove and the Nameless Sound thing and all these people who studied with Pauline Oliveros and independent theater and uh, you name it. And I mean, I was just reading this amazing book, Collision, by Pete Gershon about the contemporary art scene in Houston in the 70s where you had those crazy ant farm guys and lots of kind of like, you know, crashed car sort of art. And um, and then lastly, you know, Houston is like, if you want to write like cli-fi, you know, uh, as a speculative fiction with a climate change focus, I mean, it's kind of ground zero like on lots of different levels because it's both the cause and the result at the same time, right? It's one of the cities that's destined to sink, right? Yeah, well, I mean, like, it's like already underwater half the time. I mean, I went, I went during, when, when I was touring Tropic of Kansas, I went and did a reading there, uh, and it happened to be uh, the, like, Thursday night that Harvey was blowing in. You know, and I got out the next morning at like dawn, and I got to the, like the last pump that had gas in it, with you know the, the 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 warning signs going off over every highway entrance, and uh, by the time I got home, there were already you know, like you know submerged freeways straight out of the you know the, the cover of some 1960s J.G. Ballard novel. Yeah, we drove through once coming back from Galveston. And one of those really intense storms hit while we were there, and we we couldn't exit. There was no way to get off the expressway because it was all flooded. It was all just kind of water everywhere. And uh, I wondered at the time. I said, "Does this happen all the time in Houston? I mean, they must be really sort of uh, flood prone." Oh, it definitely from uh, the time that I lived there. I had so many friends that had to come stay with me for a while because their homes were underwater. And, you know, it just was, you know, the way it was. It's like, no big deal. Oh, we're flooded out. Can we stay for a while until it dries out? And, and so in climate change, you often think about the idea of like these coasts, the water just kind of creeping up over the cities. But in the case of Houston, it just dumps from above, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, they're designs of, you know, the whole landscape there really didn't uh, happen with any kind of planning. They really didn't think, well, maybe this will cause something to flood. It was like, well, this developer wants to spend a billion dollars. Well, fine, let them do it. Yeah. And that's uh, been their problem for a long time. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. And so, um, so I think it just makes, I think it's a tremendously rich setting. And it's, I mean, that town, it scared me at first when I first moved to Texas. And I was I was working for one of the big, the Austin office of one of the big Houston law firms. And so I would go down there often for work. And uh, and then uh, my wife, uh, who I met here, is originally from Houston. Her folks lived there. And, um, you know, they lived in Montrose. So I've seen everything from, you know, the kind of the weird quadrants around, down around Hobby Airport to the, the kind of... Uh, white shoe, you know, corporate environment of downtown Houston. And I did a lot of deals down there with all kinds of weird little startups. And, you know, some were kind of above board and some were a little dodgy. And um, I just, it's a great, you know, for if you want to write a kind of a, a crazy noir 
which this book is kind of trying to be, Houston is a really great place to do it. Well, you know, to that point about the noir quality of the book, it's it's a lot like um, like some of the pulpy pot, pot boiler kind of legal fictions, the Earl Stanley Gardner kinds of things, and Perry Mason and so forth. And I I know you've mentioned to me before that you did some of that kind of research. Uh, did you base Donny Kimo on any particular character or any particular actual real life person? Or, or? No, I mean he was kind of inspired by. Um, I mean, there was like a key initial inspiration where I saw an ad for you know one billboard lawyer here in Austin. Uh, uh, this guy David Comey, who has oh, yeah. the who has the like the lawyer who rocks ads and the Rastafarian law. Yeah, you know he's like at the biker jacket and the dreads and a suit and a tie, you know. And it's kind of like, but it's like if you want, you know, it's very Austin. It's like if you want, uh, you know, if you want your lawyer to also be in a band, <laughs> right? If that's like part of your well, that life, makes you want, sense. Why not? Yeah, and. Uh, uh, you know, and then, but then, like, you go to Houston. I have this friend uh, who's a filmmaker from Houston originally, and, and he was just, he kind of told me about some of the, like, just growing up there, like the lawyer ads that were nonstop. And, like, there's this guy, Jim Adler, the Texas Hammer, who, like, every one of his ads, he's, like, facing down a semi with a sledgehammer. And, uh, you know, like, were you hit by a big truck? You know, well, I got you covered and whack. And um, <laughs> that just kind of, I love that. You know, there's something really charismatic about that unapologetic self-promotion of the kind of the, the personal injury lawyer. So there's some of that in this character. He also takes from, uh, you know, the DNA of the kind of the, the kind of low-end criminal defense lawyer who is, you know, taking court, court appointments and working with the people who are the, you know, ones ones who were, uh, you know, the mostly guilty defendants and trying to work out these very compromised deals. Saul Goodman. A little of that, yeah. But he's also drawing from, he's kind of the burnout big law firm guy, so he's got a little bit more of a kind of establishment background behind him kind of, you know, was on that path and washed out. And he had some cred from that, too, as I recall. He does, and that helps him kind of, you know, he's the kind of lawyer who can kind of move between worlds and move across the boundaries of class, uh, which is very useful in a town like Houston, which is really so diverse. Um, and then he's also, you know, inspired by the models of some of the great, like, kind of people's lawyers or kind of radical lawyers of the 60s and 70s, which is increasingly an endangered species. You know, people like William Kunstler and, uh, you know, and all of these kinds of like outlaw, you know, radical law clinics that people started in the 60s and 70s um, that had, in many respects, such a big influence on the culture beyond just the cases they did and are kind of, I think, other than two people who were around and kind of witnessed what they did are kind of forgotten to the culture, including to the legal culture. And um, uh, there's, the, there's a French lawyer who was kind of a more contemporary uh, 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 exemplar of that, this guy Jacques Verger, who was uh, an Algerian and who got started his career doing you know, like criminal defense work for so you know alleged terrorists during the Algerian war in the 50s and then went on to be you know the guy who would defend you know the most uh, uh, sort of the people normatively deemed the most reprehensible criminals on the planet you know he would this guy who would defend like you know Carlos the Jackal or you know Pol Pot or whatever right and so trying to kind of mix up all of these different archetypes of but all of them being the kinds of the lawyers who are the champions of the underdog. Um, and even that, you know, you look at like, uh, you know, in, in, in lawyers in popular fiction, something I hadn't really thought a lot about until I decided I wanted to write a lawyer story myself and I kind of dug into it. And um, you have the better call Saul types, you have the kind of amoral trickster lawyers, but the more dominant type in like American popular culture is like that Atticus Finch, you know, champion of the underdog, the one who speaks truth to power, uh, the one who always defends the innocent person, you know, that's kind of the Perry Mason archetype. Um, 
And then, you know, so you look around in fiction, they're kind of all like that. You know, most of those Grisham characters are kind of like that. The Scott Turrell characters are all kind of, they're always like... Well, they're kind of, and they have a kind of detective aspect, too. They're, they do. They're investigating the crime, uh, the... Yeah. Well, not just the crime, but the whole context and kind of seeing where all the bodies are buried. Totally. But, but, but they're all such a contrast with, like, the lawyers, the archetypal lawyers we see in our daily news feeds. Right? Yeah, I was fascinated by the way you detail the inner workings of the legal system, the, the deal-making, the strange behavior behind the scenes. Have you gotten pushback from your fellows in the legal trade uh, for some of the things that you detailed there, which sounded, you know, I don't know if they were based on any actual things you've encountered, but it seemed like it might disturb some of your fellows. Well, no, I mean, to the contrary, lawyers love this book, at least the ones who I've heard from. And I think it's because it really is like drawn from the material of the observed world and it's character driven and it's, well, it's all driven from how I think real people would behave in these kinds of circumstances. The circumstances are a little extreme. You know, the judge is presiding over a court where he's kind of taking orders from the executive to a certain extent. You know, the, uh, the bounds of the law are very fluid and uh, being kind of situationally applied uh, by the state. But it's um, also got pretty solid legal theory in there, too. Yeah, totally. I mean, all the law in this book is drawn from real life. I mean, like I researched it at the law library. It's sort of stretched in places here, but uh, you know, you have the declaration of a state of emergency. You have the federal government has exercised its constitutionally express power to suspend habeas corpus and what it deems to be times of insurrection. Uh, the governor of the state has declared martial law in the counties where there's been this, you know, bad hurricane damage. Uh, and, uh, you know, and deployed units of the Texas military forces that are enshrined in our state constitution. And you've got kind of the Coast Guard out there turned into like some kind of FEMA Gestapo. I use the Coast Guard because, one, they're kind of like the perfect climate change Gestapo in a way. And two, because they are the only uniform branch of the armed services of the United States that can be lawfully deployed to deal with civilian stuff. Um, and so, yeah, I'm trying to draw all of that uh, from real life as well, and um, uh, and uh, and write a, you know, what what works as a legal thriller, but it's different from most legal thrillers in that most of those most of the books like, like the ones you're talking about, John, are really just about the facts. They're kind of like detective stories with this procedural overlay that, you know, uh, and, you know, that, that wrap up with a big dramatic courtroom scene that follows certain formulaic rules that uh, some readers really dig. Uh, we have some of that here, but it's, it's really, it's also about the law, right? And most of those archetypal lawyer stories I was talking about, they have this premise that the client's really innocent, right? Of, of violating a, a law that's a good law. What I do is what I think is really more true in real life, which is as I flip that, that in fact, the clients are probably guilty. It's the laws that are unjust. And when you look at it through that prism, I think you're much more accurately confronting the truth of how the system often works. The, 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 the law or its particular application is unjust, even though on the sort of objective facts, the client is guilty. I remember Scoot said when he started reading the book just a little ahead of me and, and he was saying, this is scaring the hell out of me. <laughs> uh, I mean, it is kind of a scary book and, and partly because it reflects so much of what we're in right now. Well, you know, it's funny. I have like my I was, I, I got my taxes done just a few weeks ago, and uh, my tax accountant uh, uh, is an a Afghan and Iraq War vet. And mili he was an army officer, and and uh, as well as a CPA. And he sent me a note, and he's a big devo. He said, "Chris, yeah, I don't know if you remember. I'm a big devotee of you know apocalyptic fiction. He's like binges these audiobooks. and." Uh, 
Uh, and you know, and I'm also an Army Reserve officer, and I'm detailed as like the FEMA liaison officer. And I have to tell you, yours is the most realistic dystopia of any I've ever come across. And I didn't know whether to be, I was like simultaneously delighted and horrified because here's this guy who's like going out on weekend exercising playing out scenarios and i i, I kind of infer these things like yeah these are like the scenarios we're playing out is like you know the ship channel zone is a petrochemical chernobyl after some storm and we're going in and you know rounding people up well the scariest part is is, is, is uh, as we're seeing right now what happens when the courts are politicized the Justice Department is politicized, law enforcement is politicized, and it all becomes sort of like the arm of a particular party or yeah. person. Yeah. And, and I think that that's kind of what's happening here. And, and I know that in, in your book you have a person like that, too. More, he's more prominent in the Tropic of Kansas. but. Uh, the president, a kind of I mean, Trumpian yeah. character, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, maybe more competent than Trump, which is just even scarier. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was more of a, you know, an amalgam of like it, when I originally conceived him of some kind of cross between like Mitt Romney, you know, John McCain, and Tom Cruise or something like that. I mean, it's a sort of a charismatic. He's kind of younger. He's got like a business background. Good looking guy. Yeah, sort of good looking guy. And he's like a war hero. He's been like, he was like, you know, imprisoned in this war that the U.S. was defeated in, but he like escaped. He's like a pilot that got shot. I mean, it's like John McCain, but he escaped. Like what would happen in the action movie version, although some suggest maybe it was all faked. It's kind of a political stunt, insider political stunt. Escaped from the North Koreans. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think, I mean, that was more... In the context of Tropic of Kansas, that was about kind of exploring this, like, uh, independently of kind of partisan issues, our, our increasing infatuation, at least over the course of my adult life, and I think really since, you know, probably going back to the Civil War in a way, but certainly since World War II in this country with executive power. And not just in politics, but in private life and in the kind of the you know, the, the evolution and since the 50s of kind of the corporate society that we all now live in where most people's experience of uh, hierarchies, of kind of human hierarchies are of corporate workplaces or of, you know, other nonprofit or governmental institutions that increasingly just emulate the corporate workplace and their culture. And, you know, there's this, been this idea kicking around for a while that, you know, well, what better qualification to run a country than to have run a big company? And um, and uh, and so when I wrote this book that had been around, you know, Romney was an exemplar of that, you know, both Presidents Bush, uh, you know, there's like the ex-Gateway CEO was the governor of Michigan, and there was Carly Fiorina who'd been, you know, who'd run HP. I mean, there were a lot of examples of this, and they weren't, some of them were Democrats even. Uh, I think Meg Whitman was one. She was like a, a, maybe she was a Republican. She was like the eBay CEO. Maybe ran against like Dianne Feinstein. I mean, a lot of those around. And, um, and to me, it's just like, that's kind of a scary, you know, path to go down to be thinking like that we should, you know, because uh, I worked in corporate environments, you know, at the, you know, at the, the executive level and otherwise, and, you know, those are not democracies. <laughs> They're dictatorships They're by design. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we've seen much of that in Texas. And, I mean, basically, if you don't please the oil business, uh, you're probably not going to get much accomplished. And that was a, particularly the case in Houston, which was headquarters to Exxon. Yeah, before that, they were known as humble. They were very humble. They were yeah. pretty much running yeah. you know, the uh, economy there and well throughout Texas. And uh, you know, having those people involved in the political side is just frightening because I saw how they did their business, and it's not some place you want to live when you have you know that kind of an executive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I have this whole rap about the political relevance of co-ops and kind of how I had this insight that if you've got a democracy, it's not enough for your government to be democratic. If, if the institutions where real power and real money are, are held, 
uh, i.e. corporations, are all run as oligarchies or, or uh, worse, um, then you really don't have a democracy. I mean, eventually the structure of those corporations will be reflected in the structure of governance elsewhere, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, I mean, you can you can go off into you know discussions about you know money as political speech and all that and all that jazz, and I mean, um, there's there's plenty of nonfiction material to explore there. In the context of the story of rule of capture, this figure of the president and of the faction he's part of, it's more about a kind of a resurgent nationalist uh, crew trying to. Uh, Kind of grab power, and uh, and uh, and it's about other aspects of the way in which democracy is illusory, like about how uh, you know sometimes we have elections that are really statistical ties, and how they are resolved it has a lot more to do with just base power than it does with any kind of principled method of sorting that out. Uh, you know, democracy uh, uh, certainly, as we practice, is imperfect, and um, uh, and in this story, it's exploring kind of the limits of those kinds of scenarios, and basically a, a power grab that looks some, something more like you know what you might have seen in 1970s South America, something that uh, uh, I have some exposure to through my in-laws who lived through that in Argentina, and. Uh, trying to play out some of those scenarios. And I did a lot of research on that front as well, kind of looking at like, you know, what was it like for the lawyers who were trying to help people out when their kids got locked up or whatever during the, you know, in the aftermath of the coups in Argentina and Chile and Brazil in the 60s and 70s. And um, that gives, you know, the idea of habeas corpus kind of a whole nother level of meaning. You you had a, a, an outer space kind of thing here in, in the book, and you didn't really get into it too much, except to allude to it. Are you going to do more with that? Uh, maybe. I mean, I've been playing around with writing a book, you know, just about that stuff. About, I mean, to me, the I've written. A, I mean, I have a little like medium essay I wrote a while back. I was researching a possible book about this, and I went to. Spacecom, the world's first ever, you know, uh, business trade show devoted to capitalism and space. And where did it take place? Why, Houston, Texas, of course, of course you know. And so, and it had, you know, it had like, you know, people with their space mining pitches and, you know, all these like civic boosters, you know, who wanted to promote, you know, Spaceport Houston. Uh, and, uh, you know, every manner of, you know, satellite surveillance operator and, um, uh, and that stuff's really intriguing to me because, you know, it's like, oh, we fucked up this planet pretty, pretty good with this kind of mode of th this system of dealing with our relationship with the natural world that starts with the ability of each of us to appropriate for our own exclusive benefit the things we find, which is kind of the rule of capture of the title in a way, which has a lot of very specific permutations in the law. There's a very particular one that's kind of peculiar uh, uh, to the, you know, uh, uh, mineral and you know fossil fuel extraction business and the water extraction is that businesses. the pennsylvania thing that yeah there's that pennsylvania case going on right now about whether the rule of capture under pennsylvania law applies to fracking um but uh, but in the context of space you know um the idea in the kind of uh somewhat utopian or at least idealistic internationalist or globalist treaties that are the foundations of so-called space law which is a real thing you know there's like lawyers who you know put that on their letterhead now um uh the idea was that you know that everything outside of Earth orbit is the commons. It's there for all mankind, uh, you know, um, and um, and we're working pretty fast on figuring out ways to chip away at that now. I mean, even uh, under the Obama administration, uh, enacted into law were uh, 
new provisions uh, designed to try to while the treaties prohibit people from owning real estate in space, like you can't own a piece of the moon if you're from a country that's a party to the you know 1967 Outer Space Treaty, go figure. But now under U.S. law, you can go there and take stuff out of the ground and you can own that, right? Or you can capture an asteroid and the minerals you extract the asteroid U.S. law would, would, would purport to uh, uh, allow you to have an enforceable property right in. So, and so in the context of this book, that's kind of at it, the periphery, but it's aspirational for these people who want to kind of grab their country back because they want to grab back their freedom like good Texans to kind of, you know, go and take it <laughs> not so much come and take it but to like go and take it and like that sort of hard scrabble ethos of like people whose you know ancestors in their mind you know they came here and it was like uh you know an unlivable land and they figured out a way to make it livable and how to you know round up the feral cattle and drive them halfway across the country to market and steal the land away from the people who were here under exploiting it and you know, had right. stolen it from somebody yeah, else. yeah yeah exactly well the whole space race thing that when, when that cropped up you know in the 50s after the russians you know got the lead on us and then we take the lead back and it's back and forth had less to do with the you know, with the you know the bright new future and it had more to do with the guys that were previously making fortunes off of weapons of war and you know industrial production suddenly went oh there's a new frontier for us it had nothing to do with any altruism it had to do with we can make a lot of money building for the space race and that's pretty much continued along for <laughs> to, to the present day. Oh, right on. No, that's a really important insight, and I don't think we think about it from that perspective often enough. But yeah, and in the context of this book, it's basically what's happened is what I saw at the Spacecom, which, like, Spacecom was like, you know, they've already kind of privatized the space station, the ISS. Then it's kind of, there's, like, program managers, but they're basically there to, like, rent it out, right? It's like, you know, kind of like Airbnb, you know, uh, uh, for aerospace nuts. And, and in this book, he's basically NASA was privatized, and these guys want to kind of bring it back. And that's, that's really, I think, kind of what's going on now anyway. And, um, and so uh, I just think, it's, I think that's fun, and I think it's, it's kind of more interesting to just kind of have it there like, oh, yeah, and yeah, I remember when we, remember when we had those satellites and remember when we had our, you know, asteroid mining or whatever, and wouldn't it be nice to have that back? And water is the new oil. Yeah, water is the new oil, right? Yeah, there's some far out kind of stuff along those lines in here too. But, um, uh, but I don't know, not in a way that I think is unrealistic. I mean, I don't know about the specific, you know, the kind of like deep earth water capture technology I describe in the book. I mean, I researched it. There's, you know, ideas out there along those lines. But, but in terms of the economics of that, I mean, that seems pretty you know pretty dead on to me i don't know i mean i mean um i mean, like t today i was reading the paper here about you know these like all, people all over the hill country just you know sucking the alcohol <laughs> just dry and just like these people who have been on their land for 10 20 years and, which is really nothing and they're talking about these you know well levels are just all going down because everybody's out there just sucking it out and um uh I don't know. I mean, I, I think um, it's, um, you can certainly imagine a scenario in which water really is the new oil. I mean, we have yeah. municipalities around the world now running out of water, right? And people line it up and, um, and, uh, and you think about how wasteful we are of water, of how water, I mean, where I grew up in the Midwest, water is treated almost like a waste product. You know, water is just, because there, it's not. It's a. It's yeah, a, they're water rich. It's a, it's a it's a it's a wet climate, mm. and so as a consequence, and uh, they have just fouled the entire water table with agricultural chemicals. I mean, I mean, like the guys who won the Pulitzer, one of the group that won the Pulitzer two years ago, were these small town Iowa newspaper writers who did this series of editorials about like how criminal it is what. 
uh, the agricultural industry has done to the waterways of the Midwest. And so like the whole Mississippi River watershed is just like toxic, right? And um, I mean, you just think about things like that. And so, yeah, I mean, like clean water is really a precious commodity. I remember when I took freshman year in college, I took like microeconomics, you know, kind of 101 economics. And the first lesson by this teacher was about how um, water and air had no price because they were a thing that was available with an unlimited supply. Yeah. Right? And that that's kind of like a fundamental premise of neoclassical economics, or certainly was. Yeah. And not coincidentally, I later, after graduation, ran into that guy uh, uh, in Washington at a Star Trek convention, <laughs> that same professor, and I was like, oh, that's perfect, right, you know, because also in Star Trek, there is no scarcity, right? You just kind of like ask the computer to produce whatever it is you want, and there it is through the magic door. Uh, and. Uh, this is why the guy he was surveying turned out as a staff economist at the Fed. So, well, the whole water business is a, a big impact in my part of Central Texas and Bastrop County. There's continuing battle to keep these large water interests from pumping the, the water table under Bastrop County dry and shipping it off to people that have a big need for water in their expanding cities. And that's happening all around this part of Texas. You know, the people, you know, you, know, you were talking about it being a free thing. It's very uh, much a big business now. Water is like Taking the someone's water and selling it to someone else. It's like the future, it's not evenly distributed. Yeah, well I mean, <laughs> and they're using, you know, think about how much water is used now just for fracking, just to like, you know, blast into these shale formations and to kind of break the stuff loose. It's pretty nuts. What happens with that water after, I mean, it's not I think they have to kind of recycle it. Yeah, I yeah think they they're have supposed to, to put it back into the ground uh, after it's been supposedly treated, but who knows? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, who's going to drill back down there and test it? <laughs> Certainly not the Environmental Protection Agency. Yeah. Now we're going to pause for a, a word from our sponsor, Berkey Water Filters. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, the, the other thing um, that struck me in the book was your portrayal of those like sort of right-wing nationalist guys. I mean, the ones that were kind of on the ground there and that um, your attorney was actually uh, running into. And that maybe never happened in Texas. Pounding on each other and what? so forth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I'm a little bit fascinated by the whole like right-wing cultural movement and kind of what it what are they really looking for are they really just is it just a matter of like identifying as nationalists or is it you know the the thing of white supremacy or is it about money or is there some kind of weird collectivist thing going on with those guys where they see themselves as part of a bigger whole or well it's i mean it's always about money i mean i'm a i'm a kind of economic determinist to a large extent but it's also about identity and the the kind of the the ultra nationalist you know wackos or extremists in this book are kind of different than the ones you typically might run into in american popular fiction uh, in that they're more like establishment wasp guys. They're kind of like rich wasp guys. And I wanted to take on like, it's so easy to take on, you know, the kind of like Carhartt ignoramuses, right? And to kind of paint them as, you know, troglodytic, you know, enemies of freedom who think they're, you know, fighting for freedom. Uh, and those are so much also kind of like the typical, the kind of grunts of like American like military stories about mil stories of military heroism. They're all like, you know, the kind of mutated descendants of Alvin York, right? Um, these guys are 
you know, the uh, they're good old boys, but they're also the kind of the establishment wasps of your favorite, you know, 1960s conspiracy theory. They're kind of like Bohemian Grove types. They're like, if if you wanted to invent like Wes Anderson, you know, s you know, uh, River Oaks Nazis, that's what these guys are, and um, and they're. I don't know, they're kind of, they're like, in the world of this book, they have a kind of an emerging mythos that they've developed, which is peculiar. I mean, there's sort of national culture, but in the, the Texans in this book, they have this kind of peculiarly Texas culture that's partly gleaned from stuff I found kind of digging around in like Texas legal history. And I found like a bunch of weird like speeches that would be published as pamphlets for like, you know, uh, kind of keynotes at dinners of like lawyers and members of the bench. And a lot of it was about the unique marriage of Anglo and Spanish culture that's produced, you know, the kind of the best combination of, you know, things like community property and the Anglo-American common law. And um, I don't know, so just kind of running with that and running with like what that feels like. And so like there's this kind of far out scene in the book that in a way is maybe one of the more fabulous scenes in the book where our protagonist is trying to track down this kind of old buddy of his, former colleague, who's part of this crew, and uh, they're having a funeral celebration, kind of like an outlaw funeral for this prominent, you know, privileged class judge. judge. Mm -hmm. And they're like, they, and the idea is that there's these weird traditions that have developed and they like build these funeral pyres on the like abandoned freeways or the closed off free elevated freeways of Houston with, uh, you know, vintage cars that are no longer legal to be made because of a bunch of wimpy ass globalist, you know, climate change controls where you can't have your 12 cylinder Cadillac anymore, god damn it. <laughs> and, and so these guys collect these cars and they love them kind of like the way like, I don't know, like a lot of these guys collect like, you know, vintage Porsches. It's a more like Americanized version of it. And they like build them up on the mesquite and the rebar and light them up with the body on top. It's like a Viking funeral. And in a way it's sort of like, well, that's crazy. That sounds crazy, but I don't know. Somehow, like, I don't know. To me, at least, I was writing. It's like, it's like, yeah, they, they would tell you. It was like, could totally happen. It's it felt like, pretty real to me. Yeah, yeah I've, I've met some of those people, and uh, some that I actually grew up with in West Texas, who went on to, yeah. You know, I figured their philosophy is basically they wanted when they grew up to be a combination of Chuck Norris and Conan the Barbarian. Yeah, exactly. And, and they and they've done it. It's perfect. Perfect. And you know, and there's like a, uh, there's a kind of paganism lurking behind the, 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 the brand masks of contemporary consumer culture. You know, that like the thing, all of these things that we accumulate and the kind of the semiotics of how they present us to the world, they're also like tribal totems in different ways. And I don't know, so I think I'm kind of, kind of hacking into that a little bit. I don't know. I think that's kind of fun, and there's kind of interesting material there. I got to see if I'm gonna. I may do some more of that with this uh, book I'm working on now. Yeah, I just read a book about occult influences on the current culture, especially political culture, and you know, sort of how it's been in Russia. You know, the Russians have been influenced by occult theory, and and uh, some of that has spilled over into like Trump, who's been influenced by Russians and so forth. Wow. It's a pretty crazy book, yeah. Called Dark Star Rising by Gary Latchman, who used to be the bass player for Blondie, by the way. <laughs> That's awesome. A very good writer, yeah. Yeah, you ought to read that one. That's a good book. Dark Star? Yeah, Dark Star Rising. Dark Star Rising. Yeah. That sounds interesting for sure. It was quite interesting. Back to the whole Houston setting, you know, one thing I experienced down there was when I was working as a journalist, our uh, building mates, a uh, floor below our radio station was the Prairie Law Collective, and I got to meet some of those guys, and they were, you know, the guys who didn't want a corporate law career, and they were, you know, defending, you know, the, the guilty and the not guilty. And, 
talking to some of these people just scared the crap out of me back then. You know, I, I was a bright-eyed, you know, young guy, and I thought, you know, that this, this stuff couldn't happen in Texas, could it? And sure enough, these guys were handling cases where there was, you know, people getting sentenced to, uh, you know, extreme, you know, sentences for not much of a crime. And I mean, do you I, think I, there's a, a place? In, in in the legal profession for that kind of a uh, um, uh, of a lawyer these days it seems to I mean it seems to be you know we see it, everyone wanting to push them into corporate law no I mean I just gave a talk about this at Vanderbilt Law School last week I mean I think as part of what I'm trying to do with this book is to kind of reinvigorate or refresh for the contemporary age the idea of that kind of people's lawyer right um, I mean I try to do a little bit of that in my own practice but I sort of came around to the idea maybe a little later in my career um, uh, I do think there are lawyers out there doing stuff like this, but uh, they don't get a lot of kind of media shine. Um, you know, there are people out there in, you know, staffing these immigration cases down in the frickin' tent courts at the border. Uh, and there are people down there in the county courthouse representing, and in the federal courthouse, where I did a lot of the research for this book, uh, uh, including like, you know, people in the county and federal public defender's offices providing, you know, competent defenses to uh, people who can't afford to get a defense. Um, but sadly, you know, those kinds of jobs are not really valorized in the culture of the profession anymore. And a big part of the problem is it's like so expensive to become educated uh, 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 to, to be a, you know a competently trained lawyer anymore I mean um, I was fortunate enough to go to law school on a public service scholarship and to do so and to go to my like state school at a time when the tuition was you know uh, you know a four-figure number for the whole year including your living expenses and including your beer money um, and uh, you know it's you know, 10 to 50x that now and you know most people come out of law school I always went to five figures when you put in the beer money <laughs> <laughs> people come out of law school is you know substantial you know six-figure debt right yeah and uh, and and the only people coming to campus to recruit are big law firms and uh, maybe some corporate employers, but mainly just big law firms. And even like government agencies other than the military and maybe the FBI don't recruit out of law schools on campus. And, uh, you know, if you want to work in like a clinical, you know, a kind of a like people's clinic setting, uh, you got to go find that kind of work. And, uh, and the pay, you know, is probably a fourth, if you're lucky, of what you could make in a big law firm. So, um, uh, so that probably means that the best lawyers are going into the big law firms, and and lawyers who aren't quite as good are finding themselves as public defenders. Is that the case? Uh, yeah, or there are people who you know. I mean, the public defenders pay okay. The federal public defenders get paid okay. So some of those people, you know, who are making what you could make, they make the same basically as what an assistant U.S. attorney would make, which is still probably like half what you could make in private practice, right? Uh, but so no, I mean, it's really not competitive uh, economically. And so maybe for younger people right out of school, the ones who don't get totally layered, levered up in debt, and who don't have children to feed or you know mortgages to pay or whatever but um yeah the 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 system is really stacked against the creation of those kinds of uh, uh cultures and we do have I mean, like in austin you know we have great you know legal aid kind of groups of various sorts but um uh i don't know those resources relative to where the need is are just way out of whack i mean and and it's a shame i mean but it's really like we mostly rely on the beneficence of the big law firms to make their junior lawyers spend some time doing things for free to yeah. kind of and to you know and uh, the and lawyers private practice lawyers like I am you know in addition to being a novelist you're supposed to give a certain amount of your money to the state bar that's going to go to fund these kinds of activities but you know it's kind of a an afterthought right? yeah, it seems like the media treats people who 
follow that path is, oh, bless their little hearts, they're just little crazy people who didn't do well in school and that kind of proliferates this, you know, you know, a lack of, of respect for what these people are doing. It's true, Scoop. I mean, there's a lower status associated with it in the society, like from a kind of class basis, right? Mm -hmm. And and like a legal aid lawyer, you know, driving a modest car and living a modest middle class, you know, uh, 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 standard of living is not especially, you know, uh, 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 is not treated the same as, you know, a partner in a law firm or even an associate in a big law firm. Um, and it's kind of, and it, it, it is a shame and it's kind of backwards and it's just like, kind of like the way we treat teachers in a way. I mean, there's a lot of really important things in the society where we want to attract the best people that um, are really serving the biggest need. I mean, that's where the justice system really, you know, uh, you know, Dell and Exxon don't need the best and the brightest. They're doing pretty well with their own employees, right? It's the, you know, uh, you know, my neighbors in East Austin. I mean, like the pro bono cases I get. It's just like little things. I mean, you see how uh, I helped a guy out who was this uh, ex-convict who was the brother-in-law of one of the guys who works at the door factory next to my house. And this guy had... Uh, He'd kind of been uh, deprived of, of his inheritance, his very modest inheritance when his dad died because of um, uh, he was in trouble with the law at the time. And then he had some unclaimed property with the state and it was like he couldn't get any help from the state. And then lo and behold, I offered to help him. I go show up there is like, it's just like showing up as a lawyer half the time. And suddenly if like the whole system opens up, it's like the, you know, it's like the slot machine, you know, automatically yeah. kind of starts dispensing. Cause it's just like. It says a lot about the culture. And like how you get access to your rights. It's like, you don't actually get access. I mean, think about dealing with insurance companies in this society. I mean, you think about how stacked it is against all of us getting those companies to pay what they're supposed to pay us that we've been paying yeah, for yeah, these every are month. These contractual for obligations they've committed to, but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean... Yeah, but they like, yeah, they're gonna kind of try to spin the facts and spin their obligations contractually as much as they can to make, to create as much friction as they can to you actually getting the benefit of the bargain that you've been paying for. And that kind of rule applies across the society. And, and when you take it into, uh, you know, an extreme and dramatic setting like we have in this story about, uh, uh, you know, a young woman who's witnessed a political assassination uh, uh, and uh, is being kind of hauled into the secret court system just to shut her up, um, uh, that may be an extreme example, but the kind of the dynamics there, the power dynamics there are very real. And so that's part of what I'm trying to do in this book is to kind of take one maybe extreme example with a little bit of drama, but again, grounded in realism, but to show what I think is kind of a universal point about how this society really works. Thank you, Chris, for joining us. Thank you for having me, guys. And thank Bless. you for writing that book. Thank yeah. you for scaring the crap out of me. <laughs> All right, mission accomplished. It's such a great read. I'm looking forward to the next one. Thank you. I'm looking forward to getting it out there. Chris's next novel, Failed State, is due out in the summer of 2020. Learn more about Chris and his work at ChristopherBrown.com. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.